Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Juan Altafuya. I'm, a, as Dr. Livak said, I'm a resident of the Panama. Uh, uh, I've been here for the past nine months doing some research, uh, clinical and research uh, on the lab with uh, the Seattle Science Foundation and also some uh, clinical research uh, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Lidbeck and uh, Dr. Tubbs. So a little bit about me. This is uh, Panama, my national flag on the upper right side. Uh, in the middle is uh, Panama City, where I'm from. Uh, as a curious fact from Panama, Panama is the only country in the world that uh, connects the continent and two oceans. Uh, down on the bottom right is the Panama Canal which uh, underwent uh, expansion uh, a couple of years back. And uh, on the lower left is the hospital where I work. It's the only trauma hospital in the whole country, and it's also the oldest uh, hospital of the, of, in Panama. So uh, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, Today, I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, transclival venous circulations. Uh, for, uh, our one of my objectives is to improve the understanding of the school base and its uh, venous drainage, uh, refresh, refresh our knowledge on the clival anatomy to avoid the venous breathing during neurosurgical procedures, and also because um, until the date, uh, we still don't have a, a clear understanding on the venous drainage of the, ven of the school base and where did the basilar plexus uh, drain to? Where did it communicate it? So, uh, so first, for, for one to truly understand the main pathologies that affect the, the clivus, one must first be familiarized with its uh, embryologic origin and development. Uh, during early embryologic development, uh, around the 13 and 14 week, uh, the school base, what will become the school base, can be divided into three parts. Uh, Precordal part, uh, spinal part, and uh, upper cervical part. It is in the middle third of this uh, uh, school base where we find the occipital sclerotomes that will later fuse and uh, uh, with a combination of also the fusion of the, the upper cervical sclerotomes, which will form the atlas and the axis. The occipital sclerotomes fusion will form what we will later know as the basi occiput. It is a uh, uh, depending on the degree of fusion of these clerotomes, uh, we will see uh, the, the different developmental anomalies, uh, anatomical variations such as a, a third condyle or even an occipital vertebra. And uh, also the notochord is also an important structure, uh, plays a huge role in this uh, embryologic development. Uh, it is the cephalic end of the notochord that will give uh, uh, the limit for where will the sphenoccipital fissure will form. It is important, uh, forensically speaking, uh, this sphenoccipital fissure because, uh, as we know, it closes around 16 years of age for females and 14 years of age for, for boys. Sorry. Uh, 16 years for boys and 14 years for girls. Uh, also, uh, as we can see on this uh, uh, CT scan, uh, the lateral limits of the clivus given by the by the right side arrow, uh, which is uh, where we find the petrooccipital fissure. Uh, the anterolateral limit given by the uh, foramen lacerum uh, and the posterior inferior by the foramen magnum. Uh, on the other image, we can see a sagittal cut of the, of the clivus uh, 
where we can easily identify its uh, rich trabecula, and uh, which consists mainly of uh, where we can find the bone marrow. Continuing with a, a small uh, true of the anatomical structures, uh, we can also mention the neural structures that cross uh, the clivus. As we see here in this picture, in the middle of the, of the picture, the clivus forming the bassi occiput, uh, we also see the, the petroclival ligament and the uh, abducens nerve uh, crossing right under it. It is an important structure because, as we, we will see in the, during high intensity traumas, sometimes the, this uh, abducens nerve is stretched and compressed at this level, resulting in palsy. We also see the upper limit of the clivus with the dorsum cellae uh, and uh, also uh, part of the trigeminal nerve entering Meckel's cave. Uh, on the right side image, uh, another dissection that we have done here and reported on the lab, uh, where we see ossification of Meckel's cave uh, resulting in a duplication of the uh, uh, foramina for the uh, abducens nerve uh, that may result in compression of this, as I uh, said earlier. Uh, now, after we understood a little bit of the embryology and uh, anatomy surrounding the clivus, uh, we can uh, talk a little bit about uh, its uh, pathology. Uh, clival pathology can be classified into four main groups. Uh, Non-neoplastic, neoplastic, uh, inflammatory, and traumatic. Uh, in the non-neoplastic group, we see three main, uh, three main lesions. Uh, the first of all, uh, fibrous dysplasia, which is, a, which is a developmental anomaly where mature bone of the skull is replaced by structure, structurally weak and immature uh, and also fibrous tissue. There are two types of fibrous dysplasia, uh, polyostotic, which uh, comprises 30% uh, of, the, of the cases, and uh, monostotic, uh, which involves only a single bone, uh, comprising 70% of the cases, uh, the most common one. Uh, image, imaging findings for uh, Fibrous dysplasia are very characteristic. Uh, CT showing uh, thinning of cortical bone with expansion of the affected area and a typical uh, ground glass appearance, uh, whereas MRI findings are less specific. Uh, also, we, we see neuroenteric cysts, which are developmental remnants from the endoderm. Uh, usually is suspected when we see a CT, uh, sorry, in a CT, a lytic lesion uh, with an intact cortex, uh, whereas in T1 MRIs, uh, it is iso-intense to have hypo-intense uh, in T2. And last, we have uh, echordosis physalipora, which is also a remnant of the notochord and is the counterpart of the, the non plastic counterpart of uh, chordomas. Uh, this lesion arises uh, from the clivus in the midline where it protrudes into intradural space. It's uh, usually uh, very gelatinous. In the neoplastic group, we also find three different categories. Uh, first is the chordoma, classical clival chordomas, usually account for 1% of intracranial tumors. Uh, they typically appear as centrally located, very well circumscribed uh, with expansile soft tissue masses. Uh, they, on CT, appear as uh, lytic lesions uh, with bone destructions. And MR, T2 MRI, they are very bright, a uh, feature given by its, by its high fluid content. Uh, in T1, they are dark and show moderate to, to high contrast enhancement, uh, very heterogeneous. 
uh, meningiomas, uh, usually uh, pure clival meningiomas are very rare. Uh, uh, they originate from ar arachnoid granulations. Uh, what is more, much more in the central region of the clivus. What is much more co common are petroclival meningiomas, usually with its uh, dural tail coming from the, uh, originating from the trigeminal nerve. And uh, last, we have uh, metastasis, uh, most common given by lung adenocarcinoma, prostate and melanoma in that, in that respective order. Uh, we see sagittal T2 weight images with uh, infiltration of, of the clivus, usually accompanied by uh, pneumatization and uh, sphenoid communication. In the inflammatory category, we can subdivide it into two, two types, chronic sinusitis and osteomyelitis. Usually, they have a, a high pneumatization of, of the sinus uh, walls with uh, fibrotic uh, representation on, on CT scans, uh, while osteomyelitis has a, uh, they typically appear with uh, lytic lesions of the bone cortex. Uh, we have had uh, also some cases and reports done here in the, uh, where we've uh, found uh, chronic sinusitis developing into, into a, a clival infection and also meningitis, uh, which we successfully treated with a, a high protocol of antibiotic therapy. Uh, trauma, for trauma we can see three different types of uh, fractures associated with high intensity traumas, uh, longitudinal, uh, which uh, goes through the dorsum celli, we have uh, the oblique, which uh, intersects only one petrous ridge, which is on the far left. And we have the transverse, which, which intersects both petrous ridge. They usually account for 2% of school-based ba school fractures and are associated with 25% of, uh, of mortality, usually because of uh, when they present, they are also present with a subdural hematomas of the clivus, uh, which have strong correlation with uh, uh, some of the studies that we have, uh, that I'm going to present, uh, bleeding from this uh, transclival venous plexus. So what is a transclival vein? Uh, we, we, we searched in the literature and we actually didn't find a specific uh, answer for this. We didn't know what, uh, where did the basilar plexus drain into, where did it communicate it, how some lesions that uh, uh, entered, affected the clivus or the sphenoid sinus, how it entered uh, the CNS at this level. So what we did, we uh, dissected uh, our 15 uh, caliber heads uh, previously injected with uh, blue latex, and we found that uh, there was a direct communication between the basilar venous plexus uh, uh, and uh, the uh, venous plexus on the retropharynx. Uh, uh, we call this the transclival veins, which are nothing less than an emissary vein connecting the basilar venous plexus with the retropharynx. As you can see in the image given, uh, pointed by the uh, four arrows, uh, it communicates directly into the retropharynx. Uh, we found that uh, around 66% uh, of the specimens, 10% of the specimens presented with these uh, uh, transclival veins uh, here a better image where we can see the, the vein arising from the basilar plexus entering the clivus and communicating to the, all the way to the uh, venous plexus on the retropharynx. Here a better representation. We found that uh, in 66% of the cases, they presented with these uh, transclival veins. And we also find that uh, 
uh, eight of these 10 cases uh, presented with uh, multiple transclival veins. But what also what we also find that was very, very interesting is that none of these transclival veins presented in the middle third of the clivus, as we can see on this uh, diagram on the right, uh, all of the transclival veins were found on the upper third and the lower third. We are not saying that this is the only locations that there can be seen, but in our study, uh, is, these are the results that we had. Uh, uh, why is this important uh, for closing up and conclusion? Because uh, now we know a little bit more how the uh, structures uh, deep down in the central nervous system can communicate to the outside world, to the retropharynx, uh, to the sinus area, because as we saw, uh, these transclival veins has a very close to the sphenoid sinus, and uh, these are potential sites for infections and tumor spreads. Uh, that will be it. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments?